All right, welcome back to another episode of Corked Up. Um, we don't have a guest today because we have a lot to unpack. And it was funny because I, well, actually, let's introduce ourselves first. Sorry, I'm so excited. I'm Jess, I'm Jessica Kleinschmidt. <laughs> I'm Rachel Luba. Cheers. And, um, cheers. And um, the reason why we don't have a guest this time around is because I was casually asking Rachel the other day because I wrote an article on Matt Chapman, um, who was, or well, and Scott Boris too. And we talked about arbitration. Of course, I've been covering arbitration for years, but I still want to know so much more about it. And so I casually asked Rachel and she's like, we should record this. And then it turned into, let's do it on the next podcast. So that's what we're going to talk about today with our wine word being what, Rachel? It is hashtag uh, arbitration. Yeah. So we know how today's going to going to yeah. pan out. Um, but before we get into the arbitration stuff, something that happened just last night, we were recording this today on Tuesday, and um, Fernando Tatis Jr., who is single-handedly making the Padres relevant, um, hit, um, we're going to see, you know, he swung for the fences on a 3-0 and count while the Padres were up by a lot of runs against that the ring. Yeah. Yeah, they were up by seven runs in the eighth inning, I believe, and he hit a grand slam. A grand slam. So naturally, the old men of the world, the old white men of the world, yelled at the clouds and they were pissed off about it. So for me, I'm just going to, I'm going to play devil's advocate for one second only, and I don't agree with it, but I understand why people would be upset. I've never pitched in the bigs before. But I'd be, I could see why somebody would be peeved if you're swinging for the fences on a 3-0 and count and you're up by all these runs. So that's where the controversy sets in. I don't agree with it. I think... Well, and the, the words, I guess, that um, Woodward used, right, the manager for the Rangers, was that there's just kind of these unwritten rules. And that's not how he was raised to play. And that's where like I get frustrated because I just feel like it's a microcosm of everything that's wrong with baseball right now. And the fact that we're, and then let's remember Tatis Jr. then apologizes basically. Right. And said like for doing it and basically says that, you know, or, you know, they're like, it's a learning experience. And, you know, I, I guess next time I'll take a pitch. Right. And that, that kind of makes you think, right? Now we're putting this fear into their eyes. And, and I respect the unwritten rules. It's, it's me personally, I tried to find a balanced line of old school, respecting that and embracing the bat flips and stuff like that. And it's difficult because we have people saying this and that. However, Tatis Jr. should not have apologized for He's, I mean, like I said, he's the reason why the Padres are relevant and he's so fun. Like even beyond like just in the dugout, he's dancing and he's having fun. He's being flashy and he's like sexying up baseball and he's, he's blinging himself out and, and people are making stickers of him because he's so unique looking and he's a minority and, and that's the best part about it all. And we saw a lot of players reacting to it. Trevor Bauer, of course, reacted to it and people in the a media reacted. A lot of players reacted yeah, they were to it and, and they were pro what he did and even right. I mean, and Trevor Bauer as a pitcher said it was fine. You yeah. know what I mean? So that's interesting. Well, to me, it's the problem is I understand. First of all, I am all for bat flips. I am all for, you know, showing emotion out there because I personally think that's what makes, that's what makes it exciting to watch. So, you know, I understand there's these unwritten rules about, you know, you don't bat flip and things like that, which you know, I disagree with, I think it's great and it's great for the game, but if you, you know, want to sit there and, you know, shake your head at a player that bat flips. Okay. Like I, I can understand, I guess where you're coming from, but I have a problem when you're asking a player to sacrifice an opportunity to help his team win to, you know, pat his stats because these things matter. And you know, a bat flip, whether you bat flip or not, it's never going to impact your contract, you know, or your, you know, how much money you make, yeah. your stats, your team winning. It won't. So it's just like this respect thing. So, okay, I can understand the argument, but I have a problem when you're asking a player to, you know, add, I don't know, out of respect, just take a pitch. Right. 
it to me you're, you're gonna tell a player who got to where he is being ridiculously an athlete mind full of adrenaline saying don't take it mind you i covered the a's last week alone they had a bunch of walk-off scenarios where you need insurance runs in some of yeah. these situations right because baseball fucking weird if you're down by a few runs you could easily still lose that game the we Giants won. blew a, a lead a seven and two lead and if they didn't have a grand slam in that scenario what would have happened Right. I mean, that's like a, a, a compliment to the opposing team. Like y'all could come back. Never know. Yeah. I, I, I would be offended if I were a pitcher and you're going to sit there because we're down and yeah. you're just going to go easy on me. And I think this is like a good kind of segue into, you know, talking about salary arbitration because right. to me, when it, it really bothers me, I was listening uh, this morning to mad dog on high heat. My favorite. I love, love his takes. Not, um, but I, he sat there, he basically, you know, ridiculed Tatis Jr. for what he did and then said it was a meaningless grand slam. And that bothered me. And that bothered me as an agent because I have been in salary arbitration negotiations and hearings. I've done like 26 of them. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you, Every single home run, every single RBI, every single stat matters. Like I have watched teams go in there and they distinguish two comparable players and saying, you're not worth this much because this guy has 33 home runs and you only have 29. Like that matters. And that's, that could be the difference of a million dollars. It could be the difference of $250,000, whatever it is, but that matters. And so to sit there and say that, because in this situation, you know, you were already up by, you know, a bunch of runs. I can assure you that in, in a salary arbitration hearing, let's say it's another player, you know, when Tatis goes through arbitration and another player's at hearing, and they're trying to say that, we're worth this much. And they are, the other team will bring in Tatis and say, look, he hit this many more home runs. They're not going to go there and say, well, this home run was hit in this, you know, when the team was up this much. So it doesn't really count. Right. It's like, not by scenario. It's the yeah, numbers it are there. Num every home run. And they will say, you're not worth as much as him because he has this many more home runs than you. Yeah. Like it all matters. And so to t sit there and, and argue that it it does it's a meaningless grand slam it's eyewash i hate it and and i agree and as a you know we all know when you have a three and zero count you know what pitch is coming you're gonna get fastball down the dick and you know what pitch is about to come so that's the thing right and and i'm and we're gonna segue into arbitration because that is such an important thing to talk about because like i said i was i was covering this matt chapman story i'd aggregate from it and Alex Coffey from The Athletic spoke to Scott Forrest, who is uh, Matt Chapman's agent. And being able to cover Chappie for a living is such a treat. And he's, of course, on the A's along with Matt Olson. His arbitration is going to be interesting coming up because he's still underneath team control. And I say all these things sometimes, and I'm writing it, and I'm like, well, wait, I want to make sure my reader understands this. But I can't go into detail about arbitration every single time. And so when you and I wanted to talk about this, I'm glad we brought this in, especially during this time of the of the season and knowing it's in a shortened season. So the first question I kind of wanted to bring up, Rachel, I know you know this is how do you, how would you define arbitration? And I made the joke like explain it to me like I'm five, but how would you define that to like a casual baseball fan, say their favorite players on their way toward arbitration? and you hear that as a fan, what should you know about A, the term arbitration, how it could affect your favorite player? Yeah, so I guess to just kind of explain what it means when a player is arbitration eligible, basically, so you have a team controls you when you get drafted, they control you for six years in the big leagues before then you become a free agent. So you have to accrue, so every single day that you're in the big leagues, you get one day of service. You have to hit 107, you have to get 172 days in order to get a full year of service. Mm -hmm. After six, once you hit six years, you're a free agent, right? And you can sign with any team. We all know what free agency is. Right. The first 
three years that the team controls you. So when you have less than three years of service, so all those days that add up to less than three, the team gets to unilaterally decide what to pay you. Now, they can literally pay you whatever they want. However, right. there is a minimum. It's around $560,000 right now. So I would say probably like 99% of guys that have less than three years of service are paid the minimum. Sometimes a little more, like I, the year before Mookie Betts was an arbitration eligible player, he got like 900,000 because the team, you know, he was really good. And I was going to say, that, so there's, there's possibilities where, I mean, I'm of course an A's person where they're like, Hey, we respect you. Let's add some more money onto that. Yeah. But it's, I mean, you'll never really see it be like even a million dollars. It'll just be like, you know, another couple. million though. And even, yeah. But even that is rare. So for the yeah. most part, you get about basically the minimum. Yeah. And they can, it, it's their choice. You have no say and they own you and they pay you whatever they want. Then once you hit three years of service, now you're still under team control for three more years until you hit the six. But for those three years, you get to negotiate your salary. So you get to decide, you get to, come to an agreement and prove what you're worth. And so that's our, those are your salary arbitration eligible years. So the way that we value players in arbitration is very different than the free agent market. You're still getting them for, for way under value, like market value, because it's this really complex kind of stagnant, silly system that we use, but you get to negotiate it. So for those three years, you negotiate your salary. However, they still own you. They still control you. You cannot negotiate it with any other team. It's just, so we take, you know, Matt Chapman, he's still owned by the A's, but now they don't get to unilaterally decide what to pay him for three years. He gets to negotiate a salary. Now every year, it's usually like the second week in January on a Friday, at like one, it's the deadline, the file, the, um, the filing deadline the teams have and the player have to come to an agreement on the negotiated salary for that year by that deadline if they don't they I file numbers me. they file numbers and they go to hearing and when you file numbers you basically i choose i say i'm worth this the team says we're filing at this number you're on, we're only going to pay you this amount let's say it's the difference of i file at 2 million you file at, or let's say I file at 3 million, the team files at 1 million, you go to hearing and you put on a case in front of a panel of arbitrators. So there's three and you argue why you're worth 3 million, right? I would say my agents and the union are going to say I'm worth 3 million because look at all these players in the past that were in my position. They were played, they were paid that much and I'm not good. And the team will do the opposite. Then they'll go and make their case about why, no, you look more like these players that are only worth 1 million or that we're only paid 1 million and you should be paid, you know, 1 million. And the three arbitrators will have 24 hours to decide and they will return a salary for you. And it's one or the other. There's no in between. They pick one salary. They either pick the team or they pick yours. And when you're making your case, all you have to prove, like for me to say I'm worth 3 million, all I have to do is prove that you take the midpoint. So which would be 2 million, right? That's in between the one and the three. You have to prove that you're a penny above, you're worth a penny above 2 million. And all the team has to prove is that you're worth a penny below. They don't actually have to prove you're only worth 1 million. Just that you're only a penny either below the midpoint or you would prove you're a penny above the midpoint. And then the arbitrators give you, they make a decision, either the team or the player. And what, whichever they decide, it's that salary. So if I filed at three, if they decide for me, I get paid three million. There's, they can't pick anything in between, which is different than hockey because hockey arbitration, they can pick numbers in between. But they basically make a decision. The panel the people that are deciding this are like the best way I describe it is like your grandma and grandpa. 
Um, they're labor arbitrators. They're, they've been doing this for years. They don't know baseball very well. Um, they've over the years have learned kind of what ERA is. They understand that, but they're labor arbitrators. So all they know, basically what's important to them is did you show up for work? Did you do a good job? Like that kind of thing. So, there are, so I was going to ask that. So beyond just the ERA, the, the batting average, the numbers, other stuff goes into it because the panel, the numbers aren't everything. So, right. So the weird part about arbitration is, and it confuses people is we base it off of these very antiquated stats. Like, first of all, I mean, wins and losses still kind of matter. Um, innings pitch, like the amount of innings that you pitch matters for, um, for a panel. The so pitcher wins don't matter unless it has to do with arbitration. We're going to go with that. Exactly. Yeah. So for it matters. So when you say like a pitcher, qual like a starting pitcher qualified that he had 162 innings at least because that's enough to qualify for the ERA title for a hitter. He has to have 502 plate appearances, right. To qualify for a batting title. So that threshold is huge. Like that's a massive distinguisher in the market of these guys. Basically it means you were a everyday player versus not. If you don't hit 502 plate appearances, or if you don't have 162 innings. So things like that kind of, it's all these old stats that basically front offices do not use at all to actually value players on the open market. But in arbitration, you have to make these kinds of arguments. And that's kind of how, yeah, that's how it works, unfortunately. So are some of these things cherry picked? Like, you know, you mentioned wins and stuff. So say for instance, I'm always thinking about Matt Chapman because you cannot not say he's not one of the best, he's in my, def the best defensive third baseman. So you, you compare him to the Nolan Arenados of the world. Anthony Rendon just got a fat contract. So it's really difficult for me to sit there and think of somebody who's on this panel saying, eh, like, I'm like, like, are you crazy? And that's just them saving money. Yeah. So you, the problem is you can only compare Chapman to other, if he's going to be a first time eligible player there, you're separated into classes. So there's your first time, your second time and your third time. And the way it works is it's almost like seniority. The more times you go through, the more service you have, you are, you're worth more. It doesn't matter, you know, even though, you know, we can make an argument that a guy like Aaron Judge or Cody Bellinger was worth more than just some, you know, kind of average player, average hitter going through arbitration for the third time. Chances are the guy going through the third time is going to make more because that's just kind of how you move along in the market. Um, so Matt Chapman can only compare himself to other similar players, basically, that are first that were first time eligible players as well, and what they got paid. And you usually only can you only want to go like two to three years back. So you don't want to take a player from, you know, 10 years ago and compare him to a guy from 10 years ago. So you usually try to just do like the most important, the most relevant is your first, is the guys that are in your current class and what did they get? Got it. And then the second you would go back, if there's no one that's relevant in your class, you take a, you know, you take guys from a year before or, you know, two or three and you make an argument that you're like them. But that's, that's why it's so stagnant because you're constantly comparing back like a few years. So the market doesn't move because you never have like, unless you have guys like Mookie who goes to hearing and gets a record breaking, you know, contract in arbitration because he moves the market because no player has ever gotten that much before. But those are rare. Like you have to go to hearing and win to move the market usually. So but, how, how would it differ between what usually happens in like a 60 game season? It's going to be so different this year. And they're going, basically, they're going to have to change. They're going to have to adjust everything. And these players this year, it sucks for them, honestly, because one, well, basically all the players this year, whatever they get, it's going to be really hard in future years to use them as comps, like comparable players, because it, it won't really make sense because we have this weird 60 game season. So 
it, it sucks for, you know, future generations, because what if a guy like Chapman could get a really big contract or, you know, do really well in arbitration. And then, you know, a, a younger guy coming up wants to use that, like he won't be able to use Chapman's contract. The other problem is it's going to just optically, it's going to look like no matter what you do and no matter how you kind of adjust it at the end of the day, they're going to, the teams will argue to the panel, look, they didn't, they only played 60 games though. So like they, they're not worth this much. And I think that's a good, like a, another good thing to touch on is that when in arbitration, the way you get paid, you get paid based on your prior performance. So what you're going to do next year, completely irrelevant. The only time that what is going to happen next year is relevant is if you're injured. And like Sean Mania, for example, if he has, they call it the existence of a, or a the existence of a pre-existing defect. That's what it's called. Um, if you have that, meaning like you're going to be, it means you're going to be injured basically to start the next season. That crushes your value a little bit. Like that's taken into consideration. That's like a dark cloud over his head, just always going to be yes. there. Yeah. They can pro- they probably hardcore use that against him. Right. Well, it's only for the next season. So if for the next season he won't be ready to start, then his value plummets. But other than that, anything you're going to do, like you can never, ever make an argument that, look, he's projected to do this next year. He's going to be this good. All that matters is what you did the prior year. That's the most important. And then your career matters too. It matters more your first time in arbitration. And then the second time, the, the biggest thing is like your prior season, which is called your platform year. So that's really what matters. But there are other things that go into it. Like, um, you know, I, I mean, it's one length and consistency of your career. So how consistent were you? What was your path? Like getting called up, getting, did you get sent down? It really hurts you if you get optioned. That's a big deal. Um, so like the consistency and kind of length trajectory of your career, um, your platform year. So how good was this most recent year? That's big. And then trends. It's really bad if you start off well and finish poorly, horrible. You would much rather you want to start your way up. Yeah. That's it. You will get paid more if you're trending like that in a season. Hmm. I guess it makes sense because you look more valuable. That means you can kind of improve. Up, right. Up even, even that's probably no. really going to fuck you up in a 60 game season then. Right. Because a lot of these guys don't get the, I mean, there's, there are players for sure that are going to have the advantage of there. Like there are some players out there that always start off really strong and decline. They're going to have the advantage this year of that won't be an issue. Like they'll just, cause you know, they'll probably just play strong through 60 games. However, there are also plenty of players that start off slow and you know, they heat up and they do really well. And that gives them a big bump in arbitration. And now they're not, you know, like they might only have their, you know, the shittier performance to kind of go off of. So it's going to mess it up in a lot of ways. The other thing is like, you know, if you're the team, you're going to make the argument look like he was great. But at the end of the day, we can't pay him like, you know, we paid Mookie Betts or something because he just, he only played 60 games and, you know, he, that's the reality of it. So he still wasn't as valuable as what Mookie was, but then it's going to matter. So let's say he gets paid, let's say 2 million. I'm just throwing out numbers less than what Mookie got when he was a first time. Then for his second time, you, you have to take the starting point of the salary where you came from the year before. So that matters. So if you're only coming from, if you're coming from 2 million less, it's a lot harder to even catch up to Mookie your second year because you're coming from 2 million, 2 million below. And so the higher you get up in the salary structure is what we call it the bigger the raise is for the same caliber of performance. So a guy who, if you have two guys who have the exact same performance, but one guy is coming from a million dollars and one guy is coming from 5 million, the guy from 5 million will get a bigger raise like the next year compared to the 1 million, which is like weird, but. So 
one scenario that I've always been curious about is when a player gets DFA'd, whether they want to perhaps get, I guess, demoted down to AAA or elect for free agency, those scenarios. What kind of a conversation is that between you and a client where they're like, hey, do you take a look at the free agency market? Like when Bryce Harper and Manny Machado were free agents, do you think Machado would have, I mean, depending on the scenario, of course, does it depend on the market? And I know the market, you can compare it to like buying a house, if you will, and everything like that. So what's a conversation of, from a client and an agent, like, hey, I really want to elect for free agency, but it may not be of a caliber of Manny Machado and, Brian, and Bryce Harper, but somebody of less, you know. So, yes. So when you're pre, like when you're still under six years of service and you elect or you're, you become a free agent or you get DFA'd, right? It is not the same at all as being a, a true free agent. Because here's the thing. What it means is the team, you weren't even valuable and you weren't as valuable as what the team would have to pay you in salary arb because, and which is why, because the way the salary arbitration like works is you can't really go, you can only um, get a pay cut of it's like 20% of your salary from the prior year. That's all you can, that's all they are allowed to do. So even if you don't pitch a single, let's say you don't pitch a single inning or you don't take a single, you, know, you don't have a single plate appearance, you will usually get the exact same salary you got the year before. It's very, very rare ever, unless maybe you didn't pitch at all or you didn't play at all. And then you were going to be injured for the next year. There's a chance you might get a 20% pay cut. But other than that, you're going to have to get at least the same, if not a slight raise. So what it means is if they DFA'd you or if they choose, there's the tender deadline, which is usually in the like first or second of December. Or they ask you about tenders. I love the tenders. Mm. Yes. So the tender deadline is basically right. They control you for, like I said, six years. However, once you get to the third year where you're arbitration eligible, they decide to tender you a contract or not, meaning they plan on keeping you basically. And then if they tender you, which a major, like most will get tendered, then you negotiate your salary arbitration contract. Um, if they don't tender you, they're basically saying, yeah, like we're, you're not worth whatever it's going to be in arbitration. So we're just going to let you go. What that means is though, if you get let go, you're like what you were going to get in arbitration, you're not going to get that on the free agent market, which is why they like, right. they let you go. So you're never going to be better off usually like get it, you know, becoming a free agent. Yeah. And I, I think of a sense? scenario like a Blake Trinan when it happened with the A's and he was non-tender, which was kind of surprising. But it was a thing he was declining toward the end of his contract and he hit the free agency market and he ended up with the Dodgers. But Trinan, you know, went from having a negative ERA almost to having a lot of issues and he was no longer the closer. Liam Hendricks took over that situation, but he was non-tendered, but he, I think right. he ended up better off with the Dodgers but so that was a kind of an interesting scenario and that's when I really geeked out over non-tender because like why is Blake trying to not getting this stuff but you know because up yeah I don't remember ex his exact salary I I did help I know in his arbitration case when he won because he he won it the this the year before this last year right so I don't remember exactly what a salary was but basically the A's looked at it and they were like okay from wherever he was in the, in the market, what they paid him the year before, they would have to increase it a little bit, but he was just, maybe they didn't see any value in him. Like they didn't think he was at all valuable enough to pay him anywhere around that. Right. So instead they just non-tendered him. And so now he signs a contract, but with the Dodgers, the Dodgers, what he got with the Dodgers was probably less than what he would have gotten in arbitration. Or it was just that maybe it was right around the same, but the A's were just like, for us, for our team, we have enough players. We have, we have guys like Liam Hendricks who can close for cheaper. Yeah. And Deekman was coming back too. So exactly. I get that. Yeah. So it's, if they have, a, it, it happens a lot of times, sometimes it doesn't mean that the player isn't as valuable, but what happens is sometimes they have teams have 
younger guys that are still at the or at the minimum that are going to be cheaper that can do the same job. So they'll just say, we don't want to pay. We already have two guys who can do your job who are only making $550,000. So we're going to non-tender you and you might make the exact, someone will pay you what you're worth in arbitration. Another team will, yes. but they just don't think it's worth it because they have guys for cheaper who could do it. It's like Moneyball. Yes, exactly. That's so cool. But it makes sense because I, I mean, I hate the term value because obviously I'm emotional about it, but that doesn't mean they don't value you monetarily. It's, it's a different scenario because when you attach money to it, it doesn't necessarily mean you're not valued. It's just yeah. monetarily. The, the problem, so the re, as an agent, the reason I hate arbitration, I don't think the process is bad you know, where you negotiate a salary and all of that. But the reason I don't like it, I don't like how we have to value players. I don't like that our best, some of our best players, some of the best talent that we have on the diamond are making the minimum. And, and then once they start to get more expensive, then they just get rid of them. And they're like, well, we don't want to pay you anymore. And because we'll just get the younger talent for cheaper, which is why I think, you know, like you should value these guys closer to their true market value or let them become free agents and go on the open market when they're younger and don't control them for so many years. Yeah, that's, I mean, obviously like just the team that I cover, it's just so interesting to think about. And yeah, your team is notorious for not wanting to pay. Yeah. And, um, and so, and the reason why I like that is because I have learned so much over the, over the years from it. Um, and so when I do see the Blake Trident situation, I was like, he got like a pretty good amount of money with the Dodgers, but that was still a little bit too much than what the A's are willing to pay. So it's just interesting from that. Right. Because the A's looked at it and they were like, we have, if Deakman's coming back, we have Liam Hendricks. They're going to be cheaper. Why would we pay? And, you know, if Trinan was declining that season, why would we pay that much? And the A's of all, I mean, they're one of those teams, you know, the Rays as well, that they don't want to pay if they don't have to. That's interesting. Now, these negotiation scenarios, um, these hearings, what's a, a hearing like? In, in, in those, like, like from when you walk in, cause I know it's like crack for you. You love that. But like, yeah. what's it like when you walk in there from when you. Yeah. So you walk in and everyone there's like, I don't know, 20, 30 people in this, they're in hotel. Like it's in a hotel. You live in this hotel for like a month, at least when I was at the union, cause you're doing every single case and you walk in, everyone shakes hands. You go, it's like the, you know, you do the line of the handshake. What are they going to do this year? Are they going to stand six feet apart? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, probably. But that's, so you do the handshake. It was always awkward for me because guys didn't know if they should like hug me or not. Cause I was a girl. So that part was always weird. It, yeah. I would but, make it so uncomfortable for, I'd like run up to you and jump on you and then walk away and then just leave. Yeah. So, so you have the team comes in a lot of times the team they'll bring, it's like they have one or two representatives for their, for the team. Then you have the LRD, which is the labor, labor relations department. They are the like lawyers at the commissioner's office. So they oversee all the teams in arbitration and the union oversees all the players in arbitration. And they very much control what's happening, both sides. Whereas the, the, the free agent market, there's, it's supposed to be a free market. No, one, no one's supposed to control anything. But arbitration is very different. So you walk in, so you have, you have the LRD, for, so the commissioner's office. You have the teams. You have the player is there. The player is there personally. You have an agent, your agent there. And you have the union there. And then you have um, the three panelists that are on the case and there's like a pool of 30 or whatever that they we set up the schedules like the union the commissioner's office and it's a whole thing about the panelists that you have but you have three panelists you go you do the whole handshake then they everyone sits down at a conference table the panelists are on the head of the table all three of them then the player is sitting closest to them on one side and then the agent and the MLBPA. 
Then you have the team on the other side and the LRD, so the commissioner's office. Um, the judges do, or the panelists do their little intro. Everyone's been through it, though, on at least the commissioner's office and the MLBPA. Like, you've heard it a million times. They do the intro, and then you swap books of, like, your exhibits of your case. And then when you do that, basically more than half the room gets up and leaves. So the it'll be like the commissioner's office gets up and leaves. The MLBPA will get up and leave. And they go back to their offices in the hotel. And they they go back to their offices and start picking apart your case, the other side's case and creating their rebuttal. While that's going on, the player goes first and they have an hour to give their argument. The player actually speak or do they have a representative? They have their agent or like an attorney that will do it for them. So, and the player just has to sit there and we have to give them but all the- they, But they have the right, the opportunity, if they wanted to speak for themselves, would they do it? Yeah, it's usually the only time, like I, it's happened a few times where sometimes the team will say that they're injured. They have the existence or uh, pre-existing defect. And we will have under oath, will like swear in the player and they will testify that they are healthy and that there is no, you know, injury. Um, that's, yeah. <laughs> so that's the only time they really will, they will speak. But we have to give them like the whole rundown of you can't dip in the hearing. You need to wear a suit. You have to look engaged. We've had players like fall asleep in the, in the middle, which you lost me at not having a lipper. in. I'm like, no, I'm not doing it. No. Yeah, you get, got the got to have the the nicotine gum yes. or whatever. Yeah, but so you'd be surprised some of the things that we have to tell. But you want to sh you want the player to understand that you want the panelists. They're sitting right next to the panelists. You want the panelists to feel like this is important to you. This matters. Like you care about this. If you fall asleep in the middle, they're like, "What are we doing?" Like the you don't fall asleep before. Mm hmm. Yeah. So they give, so anyways, the player gives their argument for an hour. There's a five minute break. Then the team goes, then the team gives their argument for an hour. Then you get up and everyone takes a break for 30 minutes and everyone goes back to their respective offices. But the MLB, like the commissioner's office and the union, you were already working this entire time creating a rebuttal. So they do you go back, you have 30 minute break, a 30 minute break. And then you resume back in the room. And now everybody's back in there, the MLBPA, the commissioner's office, and now you do rebuttal. And the rebuttal is basically saying, so now you have 30 minutes. Um, each side has 30 minutes to give their rebuttal. And the MLBPA is going to make the argument or like the player side, why, the team's comparable players that they used are not relevant and that it basically that their universe that they created is not the accurate universe to to basically value this player in and then you have the other side the other side will give the same thing they'll give their argument of why yours is not relevant and then after that basically you so then they do their rebuttal and then it's over and you shake hands and they'll tell you the other side, the team will tell the player, Hey man, it's just business. You know, we're sorry, blah, blah, blah. And then like, it's over and that's it. And next time I leave a date, like this is just business, just business. So, you know, right. no offense, but I've look for the most part, players don't get that upset because I feel like they know, right? Like they're they attached do. to this number. So yeah. they're like, I, buddy, I lived through it. I know how I performed. I know my numbers. They're never, they're never usually surprising. The only time yeah. and it's happened and I have seen it get heated. I've seen sides yell. I've seen people storm out of the hearing. Have like, you seen like a, a table flip or anything? Um, I have seen someone throw down a bunch of papers, scream, get up, scream and storm out. That's so the only time it's a bunch of men that are. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, but there a few I have seen look like it happens where there are just really shady things that like you know the team will do or say um you know Trevor in one of his hearings and he ripped them on social media for it he said look like this is 
it's supposed to be about my performance, not just a character assassination. And that's what they tried to make it. They tried to just say, you shouldn't pay this guy because he's a bad person. And look, like, that's not what this is about. Like, it's basically- And that's weird because, so leading up to it, it's it's never about this, this, this person, but Trevor, who has a certain personality, now they drag the character into it, right? That's weird. That's so fucked up. Yeah. So there was, how, how, I mean, cause I've seen, I watch a lot of true crime, obviously this is not the same thing, but people dig into your past, right? Like, Oh, what, what happened to you 10 years ago? Did it, do people still do that when it comes to this stuff? No, no. It, the only time that character is really brought up, um, is that you're Trevor Bauer. Right. So the way I'll explain how Trevor's was brought, was used was after his first year when he, or the first time he went, it was the second time through arbitration, he won. And he basically he wanted the number that he wanted to file at was like the six uh four twenty oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. stuff four twenty yeah so but because you know it he I it knew was, I loved him mm. yeah he was convinced not to he was told you cannot like do that and file at that so he basically like there was an article written that pass and wrote um of him taking the difference of what he only, the only, the amount he actually wanted, which was less than what he actually got and the amount that he won and donating it to charity. And that's where the 69 days of giving started. Right. And so he was doing 69 days of donating this difference in money. And he commented in it about how the arbitration process is very antiquated and that it's kind of like, he thinks it's a little silly. And he's not wrong. Like, there's a lot that's very antiquated with it. However, even when I read that, because I was working at the uni at the time, I was kind of, I remember getting a little frustrated with him because I was like, the way that comes off is a lot of people, there were like hundreds of hours that were spent into ensuring that you won and putting on a good case for you. And it seems like you just kind of laughed about it and like that it was a joke. And it's not how we meant it at all. But that's how both sides kind of, I think at first interpreted it. So the second year when he went again to hearing, which is rare that a player will go back to back, the other, the commissioner's office brought up how they basically said to the panel, they said, listen, panelists, they read the quote from like the passing article. And they said, this guy, you guys sat here and you took time out of your day and to, you know, be a panelist on his, you know, to have, to be a panelist on his hearing. And he basically walked out, you guys ruled in his favor, and he walked out and just kind of made a mockery of it. And basically, like, he didn't value your job and your time. How, like, how could you rule in favor of somebody that doesn't even take your job seriously and what you're doing, like, for the sport? And they tried to basically just use it as a way of like, it doesn't matter what his numbers say and what his value is. You can't rule for him because, you know, he didn't take, you know, this process seriously. And ultimately they didn't win that either. And the commissioner's office then fired his panel. This is so, I'm learning, this is like, I'm not even kidding, not exaggerating. I'm learning so much. It's probably my favorite episode. I could talk, I could talk forever about it, but and I, and I'm, I, I love it because I, I feel like I need to know more about it. That's why I asked you. I was like, so I was, I was reading over the Boris information. I was like, this is interesting. And I yeah. am not exaggerating when I say I would do anything for Matt Chapman. So when I was reading some of that stuff, I was like, I hope I, I want to understand it more. And I want to teach people like, this is not only just what he's worth and yeah. everything like that, but I also know Boris was trending because of everything that was happening with uh, Trevor's blog and everything. So it was just, it's it's super interesting. And so obviously like we know how clients are, but my, my question is just because like, I, I'm so rare where I make the joke, like chicks dig the long ball, cool home runs are cool, but I'm a sucker for like a mid infielder who's phenomenal on defense. So when you have a client like that going up against the Garrett Coles of the world, or, you know, when John Carlos Stanton was, when he got signed during the winter meetings, when you have somebody who can't be attached to these home run numbers, you're like, even Derek Jeter, despite, he wasn't a powerful guy, Marcus Simeon, tons of power. 
and you have these men and Marcus is on his way to re reaching free agency. How do you deal with a mid infielder compared to what these pitchers and what the Bryce Harper's of the world are getting? So there's a different market for it. Basically there's like the power there's you group guys kind of on, you know, similar players and uh, similar kind of performance. And so there's the power hitters and there's this like saying, or this precedent basically in arbitration that power pays. So they, that's why guys like Chris Davis with the A's got paid, you know, so much he gets, he got paid so much because he just he also got an extension, which never happened. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is, that is true. So power pays, but then there is the, there is another kind of part of the market. It's different. And where you have the guys who are really good defenders, that's where you have like your middle, the middle infield guys, and they are the premium, like a shortstop. And then usually second base is a premium position in the infield. So they tend to be above guys like your first base guy or, you know, Which is weird because first base, they usually have power attached to them. So if, unless you are the, a big, big home run guy at first base, you will not usually make as much as your, you know, shortstop. So luckily over the last several years, slowly we've like introduced um, some advanced stats into arbitration cases. What, like, are, what are those stats though? So like war, war is, which believe it or not, that like, that took a long time to basically. I was saying, like, that's like an older stat. That that's where we're at. So like, it took a long time to get panelists used to understanding really what war is. Cause you have an hour to make your case. And if you're using a brand new stat, you got to explain to the panelists why this stat I is valuable. Like, not, like, Hey, ISO, which is a huge power stat. They'd be like, I don't know, like exactly. I like, so yeah, we do, we, like, we do use that one, but like the reason in the beginning, it was hard to with, um, war to use, to introduce because both sides, if it didn't play in their favor, they would always bring up this argument. Let's say you said, look, his, you know, Fangraph's war is this. And then the other, or, and let, or you, let's say you showed both. You said his, you know, you showed his Fangraph's war is 10 and his um, reference war, his baseball reference war, because they use different formulas is 9.1. Okay. The other side would just come in and listen, the other side fully understands the difference in that it's still meaningful and relevant, but they would say to the panel, how can we trust a stat where that are, that is supposed to value their wins above replacement, yet these two stats from two different sources get completely different numbers. Which one do we put place value on? How do we even give value to that? We can't. So throw it out. That's so interesting because I know you, you I mean, you're a lawyer, so you have to think that way yeah. right you think logically and I don't I barely think logically because I'm such an emotional baby but and but that's what's cool about it is like you have to have the people that a spade, a spade right like this is this is, is what it is right it's the the funniest part is so when you're at the union or the commissioner's office you have to be in every single hearing so when I was there and we had 22 hearings which was the record number they've never had more than that in a season so we did two a day so for three weeks straight we would do two hearings back to back a day it was the most exhausting three weeks of my life but you would sit in there and one side like the um the commissioner's office would sit there and tell the panelists that, you know, there, the arbitration, there is precedent set here that, you know, saves matter. They're the premium, you know, the premium stat to have and ERA means nothing as a relief pitcher, nothing. And they will tell you like, this has been, you know, set and this has been made clear in past hearings and blah, blah, blah. And then all the dudes in my like, mentions, I hope they hear this. I but, really do. Oh yeah. But then three hours later in the next hearing, because remember you have different panelists, they, those, the commissioner's office will come in and say, everybody knows it's been made clear in arbitration that ERA matters. And we know that and saves look saves. Yeah, they're great. But if you don't have the ERA, like, you, you cannot make above this amount. And it's just funny because like both thought the other people like with the MLBPA and the commissioner's office, like you'll just be like looking at them and you know, both sides know you just made the exact opposite argument three hours ago. 
but you have to play the game. And so you just go back and forth for three weeks where it's like in the morning you make one argument and you're passionate about it and you say it with conviction. And three hours later, you know, in the next hearing, you make the exact opposite argument with conviction. And it's just, it's like funny because. Yeah. I mean, and I get that because like mama has mood swings, but like, you know, it's just kind of like from that perspective. That's so cool. I'm, I love this episode. This is like my favorite, but I'm like a nerd about this shit. I think it's so cool. Huh. Well, anyone in your mentions, if they're confused about relief pitchers and what matters in arbitration, the only thing that, or the one thing that everyone, both sides love to argue is that say, saves are the premium, the premium stat. So the and way, it's, I mean, the way that baseball is happening when starters don't get past five innings, would that hurt or benefit a save a, a reliever? So innings, basically like the way the bullpen, there's like this infamous bullpen pyramid, how you value play like bullpens and players that like relief pitchers, the guys that are the middle relievers are paid the least. The one, so the long innings. Those you are the have, heroes too, for the mm-hmm. record. Hello. Yeah. And then, and then you have the setup guys, the ones with a lot, with a lot of holds, those guys are like right above it. And then the closers are the top and that tent that in the past, at least I don't want to say anything that's ever going to be used against me in a hearing, but that is what kind of has driven salary for relief pitchers for a while. But that's why, um, Dylan Batances had a great case. He lost it, but they tried to make the argument that they were trying to get him paid like a closer. But the Yankees were saying he's not a closer. He doesn't have the saves to get that kind of money. He has a lot of holds, but the agents and the players were arguing, the player was arguing, look, he's got the holds, but, and he was just behind like a Raldis Chapman, Andrew Miller and stuff. So it was, you know, he didn't have the opportunity to be a closer. But if you look at his war, he's just as valuable, if not more valuable than the closers. And his war indicated that and the advanced stats did, but he lost the hearing. And it just kind of put him right back into this solidified bullpen structure of our pyramid where if you don't have the saves, you will never get paid like a closer. So like Liam Hendricks, I know we use him a lot, but we, we both love Liam. But so last season, he went from a reliever to a closer because of Blake Trinan. Yeah. So and that, that's just crazy. And that's, that was that's the a very, sh- very end of the season, very end of the season. And he will get, and so what happens is he, if you finish the season as a closer, he will compare himself to closers and yes. he will get to be in that, in that elite kind of, you know, yes. upper yes. echelon. Whereas the worst thing that could happen is if you're a closer and you lose that role in the middle of the season or at the end of the season, it's a nightmare in arbitration and it sucks. Okay. So that's good. And I, and I, so did you notice, notice like recently the last like couple seasons, the re, the bullpen has been getting a lot more respect, right? There, I'm not used to anything above. And I feel like two, two year contracts don't sound like a lot, but the relievers are the new sexy thing, right? I think Josh Hader being talked about for the Cy Young definitely helped that. So can you see that trend kind of going up with relievers are becoming the new thing. And that it's obviously because the game's changing, right? I, I'm right. old enough to remember where a guy pitched a full nine innings. Right. So I right. feel like that's a really good thing, but shitty for starters in a way. Yeah. So it hurts starters because nowadays we'll sit there and we'll compare guys. Like we'll say when for Trevor Bauer, when we had to compare him to the only comparable guy who was going, who was in his year going through arbitration last year was David Price from 2014. And he pitched like 200 and, you know, I don't know, 15, 20, 30 right. innings or something. And we had to make the distinction, like, look, Trevor pitching over 200 innings last year is way more impressive than in 2014, David Price pitching over 200 innings because there were like, over 30 players there were over 30 starters who pitched over 200 whereas this year there were or this last year I think there were like I don't know six seven or something that went over 200 so but the teams of course if they'll they love to use it against pitchers even though we both know that it's you guys manage the game differently now so that's not fair I can assure you that it's going to be a long time and before 
really, even though we might be in reality giving a lot more, placing a lot more value on the bullpens, I, it's going to be a while before bullpens actually reap those benefits in salary arbitration. They will forever, like for a long time, be paid under starters for sure. I guess that makes sense. It's just like, it's just always going to be that starters are the quarterbacks of, of, of baseball, which I, I get to a certain extent and I respect it because I know how difficult it is to be a pitcher, but at the same time, I don't know, but it's crazy. Girl, this was so much fun. I love this. I know you could talk about it forever, but I was like, I, this is the stuff I love. I would love to get, we should ask our listeners if there are other things about arbitration, because you have somewhat of an idea, obviously, like how arbitration works. I obviously like live and breathe it, but I'm wondering like listeners that are, you know, yeah. listening to this. Like, did I miss out on any questions that they're curious about? Yeah. Right. Because we can totally explain those or answer those. There's tons we didn't get into anyways. Yeah. So. And if you have any questions for me about like how to spell arbitration, like I got you. I got you. Drink arbitration. <laughs> this was so much fun. I know. I'm, I I could talk about also it. like realizing how much of a geek I am about this, this sport. Cause I feel like oftentimes I need to remind myself like how much I love this crap. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm, I'm with you. I love, I can geek out on arbitration. And this was just us casually. I mean, like asking you like, Hey, I would like to know a little bit more about arbitration. And you were like, let's go. And I've never like received a faster response from you on a text message in my life. And you're like, Oh my God. Like it was great. Cool. Well, inject yeah. this into your veins, people, because I learned so much and that was so much fun, Rage. Good. I'm glad. I'm I'm glad you appreciate arbitration. Because and little peekaboos from my nephew was really fun. I know. Too. He could have joined. He probably could have, but he's, you know, I want, I'm trying to figure out like how to put him on like one of my shows and I'm going to figure it out, but. I, you want, you told me to explain it to you like it, it you were a six-year-old or something. Oh, like, he's going to be five on New Year's Day. So that works so out. Like, that could have been it. Yeah, it would have been perfect. Like, explain it to me like I'm John Weston. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for joining us on this episode of Quirked Up. And, um, oh my gosh, I'm so excited for this one. And like I said, like genuinely, we've had like Delano DeShields on here. And I fell in love with him. But like, this is my favorite episode. He was on our, he was on your banana boat. He was on my banana boat and I would never disrespect me on my banana boat. So, but like you also were, so we're still in the running for that. So cheers to this episode of Quirk Death and we will see you next time. Cheers.